Hello everybody and welcome to Commodity Culture where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day and before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is an economist, a contrarian investor, a best-selling author, and the publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. It's Dr. Mark Faber. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, I want to get started like I do with all new guests with the origin story. So how did you first discover investing and economics? And how did that road lead you to where you are today? Well, I think uh, when I was already at school, I watched sports results like uh, bicycle races, the Tour d'Italia, the Giro d'Italia and the Tour de France and always like to watch who was uh, winning and how the positions changed. And a little later, I started to watch uh, the prices of stocks because at that time you didn't have Bloomberg and Reuters machine in private households. But you could watch, uh, watch the stock prices in the newspapers. And uh, towards the end of my studies, I had some savings, about 20,000 US, uh, because at the time while I was studying, I was uh, also ski racing in the Swiss team. So I earned some money as a result. And then uh, I said to myself, I'm going to buy some stocks, the most speculative ones. And uh, if I make money, I will take a year holiday and travel around the world. And if I lose it, I'll just go and work immediately. So I bought Penn Central and Lytton. That was in 1969 or 1970 after I had completed my PhD. <laughs> then I went to work right away because one went bankrupt, Penn Central. And then uh, Lytton went down from about, I had bought them when they were down already 80% from the highs. But then uh, Lytton went down from $10 or $11 to one and a half dollars. So I went to work afterwards. <laughs> that is my experience. Great. Interesting origin story there. Beginning with, uh, with failure is a story I hear a lot of investors talk about. And I think that builds up resilience. It instills you with the ability to take a loss um, and, and allows you to, to move forward. So I want to touch on something you mentioned recently, which was that you see similar conditions economically today to the German hyperinflationary environment of 1918 to 1923. And you wrote, in my opinion, the Fed is actually misleading the public by pretending that it is tightening monetary policies, when in reality it is pursuing policies which are likely going to increase inflationary pressures and depress real wages. So could you expand on that for us and give us your take on why would the Fed do this? What's the reason behind it? First of all, the reason is very simple. All governments and government agencies and politicians lie, period. There's no exception. They will never tell the public the truth because the truth would be unpleasant. And since they want to be reelected, or reappointed and so forth, they will pursue a policy of misleading people. Number two is very clear to me, and if you observe the last 40 years, uh, that the Fed has uh, largely uh, pursued policies that were favorable for Wall Street, the moneyed establishment, the wealthy people, uh, you look, for instance, at the increase in interest rates that we had over the last 18 months. It touches different people and different corporations in a very different way. Say, myself, I have assets. And among these assets, I hold cash. Now, whereas 18 months ago, on my cash, I did not even earn 1%, now, I've been just offered uh, yesterday and today for a one-year deposit 
six one quarter percent. You understand? For me, the increase in interest rates has been favorable because I'm a net uh, creditor. I have assets which I lend out in deposits and which I hold in stocks and in bonds and so forth and in real estate. But the poor people, and by poor people, I don't mean the poor poor. I mean everybody but the 1% richest Americans. These people, they all suffer when interest rates go up because they have credit card debts, they have student loans, they have mortgages, then some mortgage holders. They're lucky because they have fixed their mortgages, they have fixed rate mortgages. But a lot of people around the world don't have fixed rate. They have variable rates. And so when interest rates go up, the interest payments <laughs> on the debts go up, and so forth and so on. So the increase in interest rates uh, hurts some people, or most people, but it benefits the well-to-do class. Number two, it also benefits successful corporations that have a net cash position. And also, I'd like to add to this uh, policy of the Fed. If you look at real wages, just today someone, actually not one, two different parties, sent me a chart of real wages since the Carter administration, since 1979. For men, real wages since 79 are down moderately, not up. Now, in nominal terms, wages can go up, but as you know, in the last two, three years, the cost of living has gone up dramatically. And here I need to make a further point. If you have an income of, say, $10 million a year, and if you have an income of, say, $100,000 a year and two children and a wife, your food expenditures as a percentage of your income is much higher with, your, with the income of 100000 than with the income of $1 million or $10 million because uh, someone who is well-to-do, he's not going to eat 10 times more than a poor guy. Actually, very frequently, he, he will eat less at lower cost because he has a large refrigerator, he has storage space, and so forth. So he can buy wholesale or, you know, economically. The poor guy, he has to buy for the day and for the months because he doesn't have money to buy for the next six months. So rising uh, food prices and rising prices of necessities like health insurance, school fees, and so forth, and so on, transportation costs to the city, parking lot fees, and so forth. They hurt the poor guy much more than the rich. For him, he, he doesn't care. And so the reality, and we have statistics about this, the reality is that the, la uh, the standards of living of most people has been going down. But of course, the administration in the US and elsewhere, they say, oh, look at the stock market. It's going up. <laughs> the economy is so strong. When the reality is that in real terms, uh, people earn less. And a lot of people are struggling. We have statistics about that in Germany and in Europe and in the US. And when it comes to the Fed and their negative influence on the economy, you know, at the last FOMC meeting, they raised rates by 25 basis points, something everybody expected. And Jerome Powell made the most confusing statement ever. He said, I would say it's certainly possible that we will raise funds again at the September meeting if the data warranted. And I would also say it's possible that we would choose to hold steady and we're going to be making careful assessments. So he's basically saying nothing. And this sort of meaningless statement is something Powell and central bankers use time and time again. 
You mentioned that governments lie. Obviously, I would think that central bankers lie as well. Is this sort of language just used to misdirect and manipulate people into thinking everything is going fine behind the scenes? To some extent, uh, yes. But to another, uh, another condition is that if you look uh, back at the last few central bankers in the U.S., say, you had uh, Yel- you had now Powell, before that Yellen, before that Bernanke, and before that Greenspan. And before Greenspan, in my opinion, the U.S. had the last good central banker, which was called Paul Volcker. After him, uh, the Fed uh, started to print money. And under Greenspan, at least, they had a Fed chairman who knew something about economics. That I give him credit for. He is an accomplished economist, but he became also a politician that uh, kind of, you know, wanted to reward the politicians, the administration, and Wall Street. And so he printed money, but not as badly as his successor, Mr. Bernanke, and Miss Yellen, and so forth. And Anna Schwartz, who wrote the, uh, the Monetary History of the United States with Milton Friedman, she badly criticized Mr. Bernanke and his reappointment as a Fed chair uh, because she said that he's basically a money printer and nothing else. So yes, uh, the, the Fed and other central banks, or you look at the ECB in Europe, uh, it's a, even a greater disaster than the Fed. Or you look at monetary policy in Japan, now, the other day I got a, a report that said that real estate prices in Japan were up something like between 40 and 60 percent year on year for luxury properties, okay? And inflation in Japan is, say, uh, officially over 3 percent, but that doesn't reflect the reality. Uh, The true nature of inflation in Japan is higher and it is more like four, five, six percent. Anyway, the interest rates on 10 years Japanese bonds is still only 0.59 percent. So in real terms, inflation adjusted interest rates in Japan are still extremely negative. And whenever you have negative interest rates, uh, you have you have uh, basically an an inflationary impact. Now, in the U.S., I'd like to point out, interest rates are higher than they were two years ago. That uh, destroys the demand of lower income recipients, as I explained. They struggle because uh, the prices, uh, the cost of living of the household is going up more than their income. Now, they are hurt. But the rich people, the, the people that buy private planes, that buy yachts, uh, large yachts, and so forth, that play golf, they're not hurt. And what about the precious metals, gold and silver? How will gold and silver react if the scenario of higher inflation for longer plays out? Well, uh, if you look at 1970, the price of gold was $35 an ounce. It's now over 1900 and it's been kind of easing off a little bit lately and it may, may ease off more. But it was a reasonably good inflation hedge uh, considering what is the risk of uh, owning gold, you understand? If you place it, my worry about placing money on deposits with the banks is that the banks cannot repay you one day. <laughs> that is always a risk that uh, U.S. Uh, investors experience with some regional banks. But if you have gold and you keep it in a safe in your house or 
uh, in a bank or in a depository institution. It's relatively safe. The government may take it away one day. Since they manage to lock you down, they can also do all kinds of nasty things to you in the future. And since so many people seem to be in love with communism and socialism, I, I wish these people had lived under the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Uh, they would uh, not be en uh, endorsing socialism with so much enthusiasm and uh, always argue that the government should do this and the government should do that when it's being proven empirically throughout history that the private sector performs better than the government sector and the bureaucracy. Yeah, that's why I live in the Balkans, because, you know, former Yugoslavia, this was a communist nation and people remember that and they don't want to go back to that. So um, that's that's kind of. Yes, you're right. In Eastern Europe, nobody, nobody in his right mind would want to go back to wh how it was under communism. It has not, nothing to do with the Soviet occupation or the influence. It has to do, they don't want to go back to state ownership and the command economy. They know the private sector is performing better and that people work harder when they have an incentive. So if someone works hard, he earns more. And if someone is lazy, he earns less. But under communism, the lazy were re <laughs> rewarded and the hard work hard working people penal penalized. I want to ask how much credence you give to the BRICS nations creating their own currency, supposedly to be backed at least partially by gold. Could this pose a threat to the U.S. dollar as an instrument of international trade? What, what do you make of this development? Well, I'm convinced that over time, the importance of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency will diminish and eventually be eliminated. It's only a question of time. The way uh, the Spanish peseta was eliminated and the way the British pound was eliminated as a global currency. They still exist in local currency. But uh, I'd say... It's not going to happen overnight, but uh, we can see increasing uh, the trade shifting. Say in the 1960s, 1970s, 80% of global trade went through Europe and the US, in other words, through the G7 countries. Now this has diminished. And more and more trade is between Saudi Arabia and India and Saudi Arabia and uh, China and China and Brazil and China and, and Nigeria and China and the rest of Africa and so forth. So the natural uh, development is that eventually Chinese and these c countries will bypass the dollar and settle either in Chinese yuan or RMBs or in Nigerians nairas or uh, whatever. So uh, this is natural and uh, it will happen, but it's not going to happen overnight because the world uh, reserves are still predominantly in US dollars. But they will, uh, as a percent of total reserves, they have diminished and they will continue to diminish, in my opinion. You wrote recently that you're seeing some potential opportunity in Latin American stocks. You wrote, long-term buying opportunities in Latin America do not come about every day and are relatively rare. But it would seem that such a long-term buying opportunity is developing and therefore I shall increase my position in Latin American assets over the next few months. So what is it that you're seeing in Latin America that makes you bullish? Actually, buying opportunities in Latin America are very rare, not just rare. It's, it comes along once every 10, 15 years. But I started to invest in Latin America in the mid-80s because 
Asia was had gone up a lot in the 80s and uh, Japan was in the sky and I looked for, at other opportunities. So I started to travel to Peru and to Ecuador and to Argentina and Brazil and so forth. And then these markets went up 30 times afterwards. And I feel now uh, they're not as cheap as they were then because uh, in 1986, the Argentine stock market, the total value, the total market cap was less than 600 uh, million US dollars. <laughs> so it was indeed very cheap. Now it's worth more. But they're relatively cheap compared to, say, uh, the other global markets. In fact, everything is relatively cheap compared to the high price sectors in the U.S. market, which are the fang and related stocks, AI related and silicon related and uh, semiconductors and so forth. So the rest of the world is relatively low. And uh, I mean, I describe this fo the following way. In 73 and in year 2000, we had a narrow advance in the U.S., in the case of 73, in the so-called Nifty 50 stocks, and in the year 1999-2000 in tech and uh, telecommunication. Now, when these markets began to go down in a bear market, they dragged down initially everything. But uh, after 2000, the resource sector came up, as uh, you well, may well remember. Now, in the case of Japan after 89, Japan in 89 was 50% of world stock market capitalization. So everybody thought oh, when Japan goes down, it will drag down the other markets in the world as well. But that didn't happen. The money flowed out of Japan into the US NASDAQ and into other markets around the world. So my view is in the US, you have different views. They're very polarized. Some people say uh, the market will be bullish for a while. And there are some indicators like the Kopok indicator that would suggest the market is in a bull market. But other indicators suggest the opposite. So nobody knows. But my view is that whatever happens, some money will move out of the fang and fang related stocks into depressed sectors and depressed countries including latin america the reason i pick latin america is that some of my intelligent friends <laughs> i'm a, i'm an optimist but uh, some of my intelligent friends they think that uh, world war three has begun if you get into World War III, the fronts will be, say, between Europe and Russia somewhere, and between somewhere in the Pacific, between the US and China. But Latin America will be relatively insulated. Uh, so if you want to be diversified, and you believe that World War III is a possibility, I think some money in Latin, Amer Latin America will be relatively uh, safe. I mean, nothing will be safe, but relatively safe. I want to get your take on the WHO pandemic accord, wherein countries who agree to participate agree to defer to the WHO's guidelines in the, in the case that they declare a pandemic. The WHO director general recently tweeted, the next pandemic will not wait for us. We must be ready. Hashtag pandemic accord. Now, is this just a power grab? Should people be worried about this? Do you think it's all a front? Nothing will actually be done? Or do you think they will take these newfound powers, should it be applied to them, and declare climate change a pandemic or declare a new pandemic to gain sweeping powers? Well, what's your view there? We only have one pandemic in the world. And it's become extreme. The stupidity and the ignorance of bureaucracies in the Western world 
and of government leaders and the pandemic of the WEF, World Economic Forum, and the worst pandemic in my view is the WHO. In my view, it's a criminal organization. Absolutely agree with you there. Now, similar to this WHO pandemic accord and fears being pushed of another pandemic, a new pandemic, we are seeing governments pushing climate change more than ever, saying that it's not global warming anymore, it's global boiling and all these sorts of ridiculous statements. It seems that they're doing this to push for more control over citizens up ahead. Um, what is the agenda there in your view? People have said that Venice will be underwater in five years for the last 200 years. And uh, we have photos because be the, the problem of uh, history is that before about 1870, we didn't have photographic cameras and no film cameras. So when we talk about Roman history, or if we talk about the Bible, we rely on sources that existed a few hundred years after the event. So uh, you have to be very skeptical. And even today, if you talk about World War II, uh, you know, the, in Germany, the interpretation is a little bit different than in Anglo-Saxon countries and so forth. But the one thing I want to say, we have photos of the Statue of Liberty. And it's uh, on an island, I've got the name. But the Statue of Liberty in 1910 and today, the water level is exactly the same. I just saw pictures. In some areas, there's, uh, there are floods. And in Venice, there are canals that are empty <laughs> because there, there's not enough water. And someone sent me the articles of Time magazine, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal of the 70s. In the 70s, they all warned of a new ice age. <laughs> that, that would be terrible in ice age. High, high temperature uh, has advantages and disadvantages. I mean, you could plant wheat in Alaska in future or in a Antarctic Antarctica. And of course, my friends who live in the mountains in Switzerland, they are all climate activists because they say no snow, no business for San Moritz and Davos and Zermatt. But there would be more agriculture. <laughs> For the farmers in the mountains, the worst is the snow. So I can tell you, if, uh, the, if the option is another ice age or another hot period, in a hot period, the animals will grow, the dinosaurs, they thrived under high temperatures. <laughs> they didn't thrive under the freezing conditions, that I guarantee you. So I want to finish with this. We are in a very uncertain environment politically, geopolitically, and economically right now. What words of wisdom do you have for investors who want to protect their wealth and, are, and perhaps their freedoms as well in turbulent times like these? Well, uh, Ludwig von Mises, he, he rightly said, the more the government plans, uh, the more difficult it is, it is for the private entrepreneur to plan because you never know what the government will do next. Uh, so that it brings about more uncertainty. But as an individual, first of all, uh, you have to realize in a society, uh, it's difficult for the central government or Washington DC or the WHO to implement its policies everywhere. I give you an example. I happen to live in the north of Thailand in Chiang Mai. So, okay, without a vaccine, you couldn't travel to Thailand and you couldn't travel outside Thailand. There were ways to get an illegal vaccine, but I didn't want to do that. So I just stayed home. Now my home is located on a big, a piece of land, I have a, 
living quarters, I mean living house, and have an office building that is separated by, say, about 50 meters. I can live here without any problems, without ever going out. Of course, during that time, I cannot travel and so forth. But nowadays, we have the Internet. I can talk to you from my house. As long as the Internet functions, it's okay. When the Internet one day doesn't function, then I won't be able to do my business and talk to you. But I can still write, essentially, by uh, hand. Uh, the Thai authorities kind of also implemented the program that people should vaccinate and uh, the most, uh, say, uh, proponent of vaccination was the Swiss government and so they asked the Swiss living in Thailand to also vaccinate. I didn't go. They sent me three emails that I should go. I said, I'm not interested. But... Uh, other than that, I could go out any time. Uh, the bars were by and large closed, but not the ones that had connections. <laughs> and you know who the connections are. And so life for me changed very little. I didn't travel anymore, but uh, I was actually happy to be once not traveling. And uh, the life of people has now changed for the worse. As you know, airports have become a hell. Again, induced by the government regulations. First, these incompetent bureaucrats fire pilots. Then they fire anyone who doesn't get vaccinated, who works at an airport, and then, then. So now they don't have employees. Right. So b building, having your own community around you, I guess, is, is one way to put it. Having everything in place yes. where you don't need to rely yes. on the government. Or I say, outside. if you live yeah. in New York, you understand, you have no garden. So you have to go into a shop and buy. If you're not vaccinated, you don't get into the shop. That was in some cities anyway, maybe not in the U.S. But... Uh, once you're in a large city, it's easier for the government to control you. Once you're Robin Hood and living in a forest, it's more difficult for the government to control you. And so my advice to people, uh, and as I said, you have to diversify, you have to own some stocks and other things. But if you have a property in the countryside in a small village, and then you have to behave like someone from a small village. You can't arrive in a helicopter and with a private plane and seven drivers and a limousine and so forth and the Rolls Royce and the Mercedes and then and, then. And. You have to live like a local so people don't see that you are one of the city rich guys. Otherwise, they'll kill you <laughs> over time. Or rob you. Right, yeah. Keep a low profile. I have a friend. I have a friend. He's a billionaire. Uh, he's about 35, 40. He said, Mark, he's a specialist in security for software. He said, Mark, the only one thing that is safe, disappear. No social media, no interviews, just disappear. Wow. Well, I, I hope we can do an interview again and you don't disappear. <laughs> But, but but if that happens, I'll know that I got the last interview with Mark Faber. So that would be pretty cool, too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. Um, before I let you go, for those who want to learn more, can you tell us about the Gloom, Boom and Doom report? Yes, I have a Gloom, Boom and Doom report. And it comes out monthly. And I have a, another report that is less expensive. It's called the Monthly Report. And it also comes out monthly. The, the gloom, boom, and doom report is more extensive and addresses some long-term issues and cultural issues or historic issues and so forth. And the other report is more timely, kind of uh, stock-minded uh, and idea-minded uh, and is more geared towards, say, retail investors.
Great. Well, I'll put a link in the description to the website for the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report so people can check that out. Thank you once again so much for joining us today, Mark, and sharing your knowledge with our audience. It was a ton of fun. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, all the best to your viewers and to yourself. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.